just gets cut through into the room. But you can start. I think we, we are ready to start if our audience is ready. We can go? Okay, excellent. So a very warm welcome to this uh, afternoon session about climate journalism that works. My name is Justyna Kurczabińska. I am the head of the European Broadcasting Union News Strategy and uh, uh, Transformation. We know it's here. Uh, we know we need to change and we know there is no time to waste. And we have only 50 minutes to tell you about uh, climate journalism that works. So we're going to jump into it and I'm now presenting my excellent panel. So on the right, bravely with her special broken hand, unfortunately, but with us, Alex, Professor Alexandra Borhart. She is an independent researcher, journalist, and uh, most importantly today, she will speak to you as the lead author of the EBU report that was published uh, in March. And in the room with us are also co-authors, Katrin uh, Dunn and Felix uh, Simon sitting Hello. here in the first Hello. front show. <laughs> Thank you for your work as well. Uh, and also with us uh, on my right, you have Hans uh, Cosson Eide, I hope I pronounced well. Uh, he works for the uh, Norwegian public broadcaster, NRK, and he's the head of climate change and technology. And uh, on my left, uh, we also have Phil Chetwind. He's the global news director at Agence France Press. So as I said, we're going to jump into it. And first, before we dive into specific cases and into the findings of the report, I wanted you to see uh, two uh, facts that uh, I'm sure most of you know, but it feels like they are obvious, but they should be really, truly ingrained in our heads. So the first one, they come as quotes from the United Nations Chief of Communications, Nanette Brown. So the first one is, climate change is the existential priority. To limit the rise in global temperature to 1.5 degrees and avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we know we need to reduce carbon emissions by 50 first uh, 50% by 2030, that's only seven years from now, and be carbon neutral by 2050. We currently are far from achieving this and the window of opportunity is closing fast. And the second one, the G20 countries produce 80% of greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. By contrast, the 55 countries in Africa have contributed only 3 to 4% of emissions, but they are particularly affected. This was finally acknowledged at COP27. What's your reaction, uh, professional reaction, to these facts? Well, my reaction is uh, it's pretty late. We gotta get, better get down to work. And we uh, called our, our report um, Climate Journalism Between Knowledge and Impact deliberately because Knowledge has been there quite a bit. In fact, 30 years ago, I did my PhD dissertation in political science on environmental policies. The issues were all there out in the open. And uh, we, as the media industry, um, yeah, haven't really done too much, got sidetracked, did other issues. And uh, in fact, uh, when I was asked uh, by, by the EBU, you know, could you do the next report? We want to, this to be on, on climate journalism. I was like, isn't that last year's topic? And um, that's a typical journalism reaction to things because, you know, every year you have a new topic. Oh, isn't this year about AI? No, actually, this year, these are the facts. It's about the future. And second thought about this is uh, we journalists, we always think when we report the facts, we've done our duty. We, we think way too little, and this will be, uh, this will be around here at, in Perugia also, we way too little think about the impact of our reporting. And my question is, can good journalism really be good journalism if it doesn't have an impact, if it doesn't resonate with people? Thank you, Alexander. <clears throat> well, I think it's, um, not to start on a negative note, but the 1.5 degree goal is just looking incredibly unrealistic now. Um, and that gives us, I think, a, a tremendous opportunity as journalists to, to uh, use the Paris Agreement and the 1.5 degree goal to hold um, 
politicians and decision makers to account. Um, we should be careful to talk about the 1.5 degree goal as something that uh, is defining whether or not we, we succeed in this global challenge because um, 1.7 degrees is better than 2 degrees and 2 degrees is better than 3 degrees. So instead of making it sort of talking about it as something that's a, a, um, a, a deal breaker on climate change, I think we, we should really use it as a tool to, to hold world leaders accountable. Practically any head of state in the world has agreed to this incredibly ambitious goal um, and very few of them do, do enough in their home countries to, to reach it. On the other quote, uh, I mean, it just shows the, 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 the scale of this task, you know, when you have this level of, of, uh, of global injustice intertwined with this huge task. Uh, yes, it was acknowledged at COP27, but there's a lot of work left to be done on, on the whole issue of, um, of losses and damages, uh, which will be continued in COP28 and so on. And, and um, it, just, it just underlines how, how big a task this is. You're heading uh, field the exchange of the you know global news agency covering the world. So, especially on the second one, do you feel that there is enough uh, awareness, knowledge, and pictures carrying that message? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm struck by the use of the phrase "window of opportunity" because I think, from a journalism perspective, um, you know, things become much clearer in the way that we cover this story, because it used to be a future story, um, and it's now just a today story. It's become, it's come so fast at us. So, you know, everywhere all over the world, we are now covering this as a today story. So, you know, just take the Pakistan floods. I mean, the statistics from the Pakistan floods are astonishing. One third of the country underwater at some point. Eight million people displaced. Um, this is where we are. Now, in, in, in a way, we can just move beyond the, st uh, the statistics immediately and just look at what is going on around the world, you know, as news stories every day. You know, the gloves are off, it's absolutely clear. Thank you very much. So, as I said, we're going to move fast. Now over to Alexandra to give you the key findings on the report that we've been, had, I also had a pleasure to work together with. And I just wanted to say that this report brings examples and interviews not only from public service media. This is a real compilation of of uh, experiences and different angles. Alexandra, floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. And important additional information is also it can be downloaded for free. Everyone can read it. It has 186 pages, I think. But don't worry about it. There's a lot of beautiful imagery in there, so it's actually enjoyable too. Um, yes, climate journalism that works between knowledge and impact. And the first thing I'm going to say here is, is that it's actually, for us journalists, it's not optional because it's journalism's mission. We are required to inform the public, educate the public about the risks they are facing and to make sound decisions for their lives and the lives of their uh, children and communities. So it's actually nothing we can opt out of, uh, even if there might be more interesting, uh, seemingly more interesting topics around. Yeah, what, what did we do here? Uh, content, uh, how to craft journalism that resonates with people, that actually works, has an impact. It includes many case studies, and actually two case studies will be here on NRK's climate strategy and on AFP's uh, uh, future of, of the planet uh, hub. So I'm, I'm very happy to have uh, Hans and, and Phil here. Um, we, we also put, put, put together lots of resources and uh, yeah, Catherine and, and Felix did a lot of that. Catherine works at, at the Oxford Climate Journalism Network uh, as a content editor and, and she did a tremendous job uh, including a glossary, what every editor, so every single person in the room should know about uh, climate change. Well, the audience of these reports is always media leaders, it's journalists and also communication professionals, everyone who wants their communication to have an impact. And it's a qualitative study. We did interviews, uh, structured interviews, basically with more than 40 media leaders, climate journalists, uh, academics, experts in climate communications from across the world and included the latest uh, research. Yes, key findings to, to put the summary in the beginning. Uh, well, it is late. The media has only started to tackle climate journalism, which is unfortunate because, as I said, the issues have been out in the open for three decades, basically. 
There is too much doom and gloom and too little focus on explanation and solutions. And we really found uh, when we uh, interviewed with people uh, that actually what works from an audience perspective is very much constructive and solutions journalism. Third finding that very much comes from communication science, communication research, is that actually facts alone don't help. We journalists often think that once we've reported the facts, as I said, our job is done and we've done enough. And so, you know, uh, people have this duty to, to just consume the facts and then they know. But actually, uh, it, it makes a lot of a difference how the facts are presented. The messenger is very often more important than the message because people tend to learn from their peers much more than they learn from people from outside their peer group, from, from the expert. Even the, I tend to say even the millionaire uh, will probably be more likely to, to ch adjust her or his behavior uh, when their millionaire buddies uh, change their behavior. So really, it really makes a difference what your influencers are. There are too many silos in newsrooms, but climate impact needs to par be part of all beats. And I, I used to run the, the business section, uh, the business news desk at, at uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, and actually, um, I really think the, the business section, the, the, the economics uh, coverage, uh, that's probably the most important part where climate uh, knowledge, climate, uh, climate journalism needs to, 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 uh, to be present. And interestingly, uh, doing research and and uh, yeah, looking around me, actually many industries have done a much better job so far developing climate and sustainability uh, strategies. So the media is actually lagging behind, which is, which is uh, something that we shouldn't really be too proud of. Basic climate literacy is a must. That's why we included uh, so many facts and, and uh, yeah, uh, sources that you could use. Uh, very important also, whether you're a big newsroom, small newsroom, uh, public service media, wherever you are based in this world, there's no one-size-fits-all model. Uh, so everyone has to find their own climate strategy and you'll learn from uh, two news media what these strategies could look like. Uh, and last point, the media has a hard time living up to their own standards in sustainability, which can be a problem of credibility. So if you just write, you know, great commentary uh, columns on how important uh, sustainability policies are, but you don't have one in your own, uh, in your own organization, then the public uh, might get suspicious, like, do they really mean it, you know, or uh, what are they going to do about it? And maybe that's also a subject for discussion. What I really, really uh, enjoyed, uh, Catherine and I did this interview with, with Matt Winning, who's a, he's an environmental economist and also a stand-up comedian, and he decided one day to, to, to merge, actually, stand-up comedy uh, with his uh, profession. And uh, he said that, quote, we have to make content we don't make content for. And I think this is incredibly important because if journalism is to have an impact, we really need to think about uh, who are we not reaching? He says, he, I'm not doing my, my comedy for, for uh, people who are in uh, NGOs or whatever, who know the facts anyway, but we have to think, how do we reach out to people who don't really know uh, to how to make a sense of it? Here are five recommendations for climate journalism with impact, and that is actually based on research, uh, a lot of it done at the University of Colorado, um, at, at their, uh, their, their uh, chair of, of environmental policy. Um, um, uh, Max, Max Boykov is the professor uh, I, I got those from, um, and that really relates to what, what Phil just said. Uh, first recommendation is stories that focus on the here and now are important, and coincidentally there is a picture of the Pakistan uh, floods in there. Stories that, that fit into the local context, so make people feel that they are affected, that it's not somewhere uh, far off, because you can do the best journalism, the best storytelling, award-winning journalism even that some of uh, our interviewees said and it doesn't resonate with people because people feel this is someone else's problem not their problem. Uh, third, uh, third point and I find this very important that came up again and again in our interviews um, do stories or try to fit in stories that emphasize the benefits of change just 
Watch the language. Very often with climate journalism, we, we this is full. The stories are full of words like uh, crisis, sacrifice, loss, uh, the change, uh, discomfort, whatever. And uh, but there are actually positive effects of adjusting our lifestyles to more sustainability, like better air quality, improvement in public health, maybe uh, enjoyable cities, livable cities. So. Don't neglect that these changes will have benefits and there's a whole school of thought on uh, how could we, for example, replace uh, the gross national product as a, as a measurement for growth and include some more sustainability in that, but that these discussions seem to end in nowhere. But we as journalists have the, the, the I think we have the obligation to, to really find different uh, economic narratives as well. Uh, stories where people find agency and, and solutions really, really important. I talked to, I talked to um, the uh, the ombudswoman uh, of of the uh, Netherlands Public Service Media, and she said, uh, in children's TV, actually, we give children lots of agency. That you know, it's always like, oh, you can do this, and if you do that, this happens. And then once you know, people grow up and and sit in front of the eight o'clock evening news, uh, they are just they are just. Uh, reduced to being victims, like, you know, oh, everything is thrown at them and uh, actually government has to, to make the changes, so actually give people agency, so give it back to them. Uh, and five, this is really uh, what you do, uh, what everyone uh, is basically, uh, current journal, modern journalism, approach different audiences differently. Very important. And this actually, everything should be fun and super interesting. And this is Wolfgang Blau, who, who, who uh, also, also um, we, we owe credit for, because he's, he was really um, doing research on climate journalism where many people were not interested uh, yet. And he says, we are looking at the biggest reconstruction story since World War II. We have to reinvent our economies. And isn't that fun? Isn't that exciting? Uh, shouldn't we really uh, do this with a lot of energy and, and diligence? Yes, and uh, we, dig, we dug out some case studies. I'm not going through them because uh, yeah, Hans and, and Phil are here. Um, another one I mentioned, this is in the middle, Deutsche Welle, uh, that broadcasts all over the world, uh, developing really um, very much uh, usable uh, YouTube formats that, that resonate with young people. But we have lots of these case studies in the report. And uh, this is also Manuela Kasper Klarich, the editor in chief of Deutsche Welle. And uh, this should be a positive side effect for newsrooms uh, really investing energy in climate journalism because it's a draw for talent. And uh, probably there are quite a few of you here in the room who, who know that our uh, our profession is facing a talent uh, crisis. And she said, actually, uh, many people who apply with us say, oh, we've seen all your interesting and, and engaging climate journalism. We, I want to work here because you're doing this cool stuff. So it should be, it could be a draw for talent. Uh, what you'll find also in the report, and I'm not going to go into this in detail, seven questions to check your climate strategy uh, if you ha can answer every one of these seven questions with a yes, uh, you're probably doing fine, so keep going. Uh, but uh, I guess many, many newsrooms, uh, even you know, if it might, might uh, look like uh, they have a climate strategy or their, their CEO or editor-in-chief says they have one, uh, maybe there's still some work to do on these seven questions. And actually, in our case, when I talked to, uh, to, to, to Hans Boss, uh, Helge Solberg, uh, she was the first one who said, like, oh, you want to interview me on, on climate journalism? Well, let me send you my, our climate strategy. And I was like, wow, you know, there are actually newsrooms that have a climate strategy. And last point I would like to make is that uh, if you still need uh, some convincing power, if you have to convince your editor-in-chief uh, or whoever else that actually investment in climate journalism is worth it, please tell them it's worth it because when you are tackling a, a difficult subject like climate journalism really well, you will solve lots of problems the rest of your journalism also has. Uh, and that is uh, our, basically, these are our conclusions and we just, uh, we just have seven of these conclusions, and I'm sure every one of you will find a lot more. Uh, one is that today's journalism is 
too much uh, stuck in the now, too much is reported, too little is explained, but we should focus a lot more, not only on the now, the today story, but also on the future. We owe this to young people, the young generation, uh, but actually climate journalism, climate reporting could be an engine to really convince young people that journalism really makes a difference and is important to them. Second is uh, climate protection needs hope and inspire action. That's why we should focus so much more as we're already doing on constructive and solutions journalism. And there are tons of panels here in, in Perugia on constructive and solutions journalism. Number three is uh, very much uh, tied to this, what I tend to call he said, she said journalism. Lots of po particularly political journalism is very much into uh, he said that, she said that, a lot about quotes and not too much about facts. But actually the climate doesn't care about that. Climate only cares about what actually happened. So climate journalism should focus much more on data than on quotes and that would actually be very good for the rest of journalism, the rest of journalism, for all the journalism, uh, focusing more on data than, than on quotes would be helpful. Yeah, I already made the, fir the, the number four point. Climate journalism that works approaches audiences with respect, different audiences differently in a language they understand. Journalism needs to become much more diverse and inclusive. And isn't that just the case, not only for climate journalism, but for all kinds of journalism? Okay, somehow the picture got, got lost here. I know it follows only in the end. Um, climate journalism, that's number five, needs to be local. And, and actually, there was a big mistake when journalism tried to really just only go for reach and scale while neglecting the needs of the audiences right in front of the doorstep. But local media can really make a difference here because people don't find information, local information on climate change, on what, they, what kind of difference they can make uh, if they, if local media don't provide it, and obviously public service media also has a strong, uh, yeah, has, has the, the responsibility and the mandate and an advantage uh, also to really report locally. Number six is um, that climate journalism needs to have an impact and newsroom should focus much more on news consumption habits than they have done so before. News avoidance uh, has been a big uh, topic. Um, we, the new term is talking about news outsiders, people that are not even reached by news. So climate journalism needs, an, it needs to have an impact, so it should really try to target those audiences that are not used. Remember uh, Matt Winning when he said we need to make content for people we don't make uh, content for. So this is really important for all journalism. And uh, number seven is that climate journalism definitely profits co from collaboration, uh, but lots of journalism profits from collaboration. The, the era of strict competition is really uh, gone and with data journalism projects, with collaborative use of resources, uh, investigations, um, many news organizations are already on a good path to more collaboration and uh, I'm, I'm always saying collaboration is the new competition. And I'll finish with Nanette Brown also that, that Justina began with. Uh, we want to hook people on hope, not on fear. Obviously, there is a lot that needs to be investigated. Obviously, there's a lot of power hold being, being held to account, a lot of investigations, but what we really need to hook people on to really have an impact is we need to hook them on hope that they can actually have an impact. And that's actually what journalism's mission is, also helping people to have an impact themselves. Here are our authors and yeah, so much for me. Thank you very much, Alexandra, Catherine, and Felix. Uh, you can scan it. You can also go to the EBU website and look for the climate report. Thank you for this uh, global overview. So let's travel to Norway with Hans, and let's focus now on a specific case. Um, tell us a bit more about the strategy. Do you just have a climate desk? And more importantly, if this strategy uh, you know, struck resonance with your audiences. Thank you, and thank you for an uh, excellent presentation, Alexandra. It's amazing to see how much is happening in different newsrooms around the, the world now. Um, we started back in 2020 uh, establishing two climate change teams, one focusing on news, 
which I'm heading, and uh, um, another team focusing on in-depth feature articles. And we work together as one uh, as one team, put together with uh, journalists from different disciplines, from politics, foreign affairs, um, culture, and so on. At the same time, we launched this strategy. Um, I won't drag you through the whole thing, but but taking some sort of direction for uh, where the NRK's climate journalism should be should be headed. And this isn't a strategy just for our climate change team, but for the entire uh, broadcasting uh, organization. Um, the most substantial points of the strategy, I think, is seems now when we look back to almost be uh, a bit trivial. We say things like, the scientific consensus is so strong that there's no reason to, to focus our journalism on whether or not that consensus is there. We need to look forward uh, and look at how we as a society deal with this incredibly big challenge. Um, and in that, we warn against uh, false balance of, of uh, having climate debates where you know you just use this uh, journalistic uh, reflex of saying, okay, this, here's a guy talking about climate change, we need someone who who thinks this isn't happening. Um, but a lot has changed in these three years. Looking at it now, it, it seems, it seems um, uh, almost simple to say those things, but looking at where we were as a news organization uh, th three years ago, I think this was, was needed to say very clearly. Um, and I think if you look at the difference between our journalism now and three years ago, you have you have much less of these issues of false balance and so on. You have a much more coherent coverage with a with a direction, and that's also more constructive in the fact that it looks more at the future and what we do with this problem. It's difficult to be constructive on climate change because uh, uh, things aren't looking very good, but um, in solutions that we're looking for, just in asking questions about how do we deal with this, are we doing enough, I think it's uh, being constructive on some level. Um, yeah, and I think more teams than before involve themselves in climate reporting. We have the specialized team, but we're not trying to sort of take ownership of climate change as a topic in the in the newsroom, um, because this is a topic that influences any area of society. So, so political journalists should be covering climate change. Local journalists in our district offices should be covering climate change and seeing those perspectives uh, in the stories they they are otherwise uh, writing, whether it's on, yeah economy, politics, all sorts of subjects. So we see more of that. Um, and I think just having some sort of document, whether it's a strategy or a, a dictionary or, or some sort of thing to refer to, I think helps people who, to, to sort of lower the barrier to, to, um, to try clim climate angles on their, on their stories. Thank you very much, Hans. Let's now move to Phil. Phil, you created the um, Climate Hub. Uh, at AFP, what triggered it and how does it affect your coverage that you deliver to other media organizations? Well, we first made what we call the future of the planet um, a editorial priority about four years ago, uh, before the pandemic. Um, and we did that, we felt, on the basis of facts, um, that it was simply that bigger story. Now, at that point, of course, you still got pushback from people saying, oh, well, hang on, now you're becoming an activist, now you're thinking that, you know, you're choosing this subject. We said, no, no, the, as you say, the, the science is concluded. This is, what is, what's a bigger story than the future of the planet? Um, so it took a bit of a while for the newsroom to, to accept that. We, we wanted it to be the whole newsroom. That 1,700 journalists around the world needed to embrace that, not the climate team. Everybody needed to embrace that. I will say the pandemic shot a huge hole in that because, of course, the pandemic was just one of those stories that blows everybody out of the water and you then, you know, it's not the tomorrow's story, it's the today's story. Um, and, but we made some progress culturally, but what, what, what really changed is probably at the beginning of last year when we, we set up what we call the Future of the Planet Hub um, with a tagline, Beyond Fear. Um, now, the idea behind the future of the planet is way beyond climate. It, it, it's about diversity, it's about uh, biodiversity, climate, but in particular bringing the industries that are involved 
in producing greenhouse gases together, the coverage of those industries and those areas together with the climate people. So we've now got the science and environment correspondence in the same hub as we, we chopped up the business team and we put the industry people there, we put the energy people there, agriculture, transport, so that they're all interacting in real time on stories. And so you're telling the story, yes, from a science and environment point of view, but at the same time, the thing that drives it forward is transition, the transition of the economy, the transition of technological transition of our society, and turns it into a, a proactive story, not just the doom and gloom. With that, so you've got a pole of expertise based in, in Paris for the whole newsroom. Of course, you're going to create extra jobs. We're creating new jobs in Brazil, in Bangkok, in Africa, and so on, to boost, have more specialists in the field. But really, we want to motivate the entire newsroom. So we've got about 100 what, what I would call apostles in different bureaus around the world who really drive ideas in our 100 plus 150 bureaus around the world. So that every bureau has got somebody who's really pushing these stories. Um, and against that, what we, we're trying to create a culture that goes with that. So a huge part of that too is training. You've got to train your newsroom to be climate literate. So in the course of a year, we have trained, I think, over 350 of our journalists uh, on you know, the sort of things that really would have been just outsourced to climate journalists or environment correspondents in the past. So you're really developing a climate literacy. And then 350 on sort of basic that, and then 200 also on greenwashing. I think there's a huge issue, which touches also on disinformation. We, we, we appointed a head of um, uh, chief fact checker for, for environmental issues and developed a particularly strong model on greenwashing. How many rubbish stories have you all read about this company going carbon neutral by 2050? You know, uh, the Qatar World Cup was carbon neutral. You know, I mean, you, you can Google it and see it. So, you know, that, that's a huge, hugely important part uh, of the coverage of, of training. And we're re releasing a new, actually, training today for, for newsrooms around the world um, about climate disinformation, which you'll be able to find online. Um, then in terms of how we cover, how do you get people to engage in what we're doing? Visual first. It's got to be visual first. Uh, we're a visual-first news agency, um, and you can engage. We all know that mobile digital storytelling is led by images and Im strong visual stories. You can engage on people. Human storytelling. It's about telling stories from the bottom up, about real people doing things. Um, we appointed a video and photo climate coordinator. So we have two people working on the images globally with our teams around the world all the time to try and think, how can we tell that story visually? Um, and, and that's a huge driver of, of engagement. And you can, and, and part of, because we're a news agency, part of the things that you're doing is you're creating a huge amount of really strong stock images, which were some of them in, in, in this lovely report, um, which newsrooms can use around the world, be they great drone images, be they from Greenland or Antarctica, wherever they are, really, really strong images, again, that will help drive our clients' uh, engagement. And what we really want is we want this culture, this change in all our bureaus. And there's a really good example is Baghdad. Now, Baghdad has been a place of conflict. Our team there has been covering wars and conflict and ISIS and, 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 and everything. And when we sent a new bureau chief there about a year ago, that's what he thought his beat was. He thought he was going to be involved in conflict. And in actual fact, he's, it's, he's just realized it's, it's climate. I mean, it's... You can just see it. He's got incredible sandstorms, unbelievable temperatures. And, you know, what we can do is we can tell that amazing story with our network. We can go from, you know, we, we, we did an incredible reportage on the whole of the, of the Tigris and the drying up of the Tigris, going from the, the damming up in Turkey all the way down to Basra. And you can see the effects all the way down. You can tell it with incredible images. And also by focusing on human beings, you can see what local people are doing, which often where the solutions and positive element or constructive element come in, you can see what local people are doing, not what the government is doing, of course, what local people are doing to tell that story, which, which gives the coverage you know, a, strong, a, a strong lift. Um, it's important we work on new formats, so we're working a lot with creating what we call social stories, which is a format for our clients, which they can use on things like TikTok or Instagram, what have you. That's important, simplistic for some, but for us, simple, effective ways of telling what is, can be a complicated story. Um, and, you know, I just round, finish it off really by what Alexander was saying about corporate responsibility. We have to try to walk the walk. We can't just 
preach to people. And that's a real challenge for global news organizations and any news organizations that move people around a lot. Um, how do we you know, find our way with that challenge? And that, that is hard. Um, we're doing a lot of work at the moment on our own carbon footprint, how to manage that. We're doing a lot of work um, on a company ethics charter, which again is demanded by the staff. People who want to work for us, especially younger people, want to know what we're doing to match the journalism that we're doing. Um, and and that, that's a really challenging thing for news organisations, but we've got to come up with solutions. And it was quite interesting because we looked at COP27 coverage and we're now planning COP28. And it, you know, by really looking at it and making compromises, sure, uh, we've, we think that we can reduce our carbon footprints on COP28 versus COP27 by 40%. It's frustrating sometimes because you, you are making some compromises and also in newsrooms, compromises often are more expensive. It's six times more expensive to take the Eurostar to London than it is to take EGJet. You know? So you know, th those things also have a financial impact on news organizations where you know, we know we're not all loaded with money, right? So, um, but that is incredibly important and one of the biggest challenges. And I think generally the, the media industry is behind on that issue. Thank you very much, Phil. Uh, I would like to focus a little bit nevertheless on the audience, because this is where we want to get to our message. And uh, you touched upon this, Phil. Um, it's about uh, the trust of audiences, and it's about impartiality and being accused of activism. We heard a lot during one of our conferences, especially from uh, weather anchors, that yes, they are very often a subject even of uh, you know, hate speech or being accused of activism. So how do you tackle that? How do you tackle, uh, strike the balance between impartiality and being accused of um, activism? How your journalists deal with it, Hans? Well, I think one of the main reasons to approach that is just being very rigorous in, in, in the journalism and basic, you know, facts-driven journalism that, that uh, like Alexandra said as well, to, to, to focus on the facts and numbers. Um, there is this accusation of activism. It comes from a very particular place that we all recognize uh, that's, that's politically driven and I don't think we should pay too much attention to, to those accusations as long as we basically do the same thing as we do on any other topic. Look at science, look at what's happening and report on it. Um, uh, you know, accepting, accepting the science and looking at how we as a society deal with that, that's not activism. Um, I think another key thing for us has been before we sort of reorganized and, and, and looked at this more as um, with a strategic look, we, we our climate reporting was very much based on, on individual initiatives um, that were well intended. But uh, but uh, you know, if you're a single reporter coming to work in the evening and and you like to cover climate change, and there's a report on climate change, you know, you're likely to be covering that. And what you end up doing as an organization over time is repeating a lot of the same messages over and over again, which the audience obviously, uh, and for good reasons, uh, doesn't want, but also that gives a lot of power to the people writing these reports. And you know, one thing is the IPCC, the sort of gold standard of, of climate science, but there's a lot of reports produced by uh, NGOs and interest organizations that basically conclude uh, whatever that NGO or interest organization's agenda is. And, and you know, that's not really, uh, news. So, so, so turning away from that, I think, as well helps in in, in building trust in our reporting and um, and is um, more impartial. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to ask Alexandra. You uh, in the report, there is quite a lot of material about uh, human psychology. So um, it's all very well, of course, reporting facts, but we know, you know that there is, uh, we, we're fighting news avoidance. This is not a, the subject. We don't want to be said any or saddened anymore. So how these findings, uh, what they tell you in terms of how to craft the narrative to get the engagement of the audiences? Yeah, obviously there's still <clears throat> stories to report and you can't uh, craft every narrative um, to make it fit, fit your needs. But uh, the puzzling thing I found was that there's actually really, really good literature on climate, successful climate communications out there. And most of it was published in like 2014, 2015. And newsrooms 
haven't even acknowledged it. And I wish we would pay much more attention to human psychology and impact. And what uh, many people I, I interviewed uh, also said that actually people don't like to feel guilty, for example. So it's a really, it's a real turn off when you make people feel guilty all the time about their behavior, make them, give them agency, uh, let them know that they, they really can, can affect things, that, them, that they can advocate for uh, broader political so solutions, structural solutions, give them a positive, I already mentioned that, a positive uh, outlook on what a world, a more sustainable world could look like. And don't really uh, put, put it down to everyone's, uh, you know, everyone feeling guilty about flying, which of course we all do, I guess. I mean, you just mentioned that tricky, tricky subject and I found in every book I read, it was like, oh, you know, I'm a climate scientist, but I still fly and, you know, I don't know how to handle, I, I guess that's, I guess that's a really, real tricky issue. But if you make fe feel, people feel guilty all the time, um, you know, you won't achieve much. So obviously everyone can draw their own conclusions, but you, people need to step uh, beyond that. So really um, making them feel more uh, competitive about finding solutions, you know, what are, what, reporting on what their peers are doing, making them feel like, oh, you know, if, if, this, if my neighbor can do that, I might be able to do this, you know, how can I creatively solve problems? I think there is a lot more, there should be more fun to, to reporting on, on solutions and less guilt. Thank you very much, Alexandra. I think that we have uh, a few minutes and, and perhaps we could open two questions from the floor. So if we could have the microphone, is it possible? Not yet, in five minutes, that's okay. We can, uh... yes, we read, uh... okay. So um, while we're getting the mic, uh, I think that uh, this we have already commented on. I would like to ask you, Phil, um, because you're delivering, as I said, content to media organizations. How do you see an engagement or how do you see the usage of the content that you deliver? Are there regional dif differences in what is being shown and is, it, is there an increased need for this type of content? And is it still, is it still you know, the, the pictures which are basically showing the, um, um, uh, the negative impact or is there a need for more constructive? Well, I think well, one, of, one of the things I think uh, internally that killed the activist debate was simply the, the huge uptick in client usage. Um, mm. So once they could start to see the degree to which globe media around the world, and you can track, you know, almost every country in the world was starting to engage with this content. And there's been, a, you know, a huge upward tick over, over four years, uh, which really confirmed, you know, this, driven again also by the here and now news story, which has changed. Um, you could see uh, that that was having a huge impact. It is very much driven by images, and, and I think this is, this is interesting, um, because when you have, when your most viewed images across your entire global client base of thousands of media are air pollution in Delhi, I think five, six years ago, we would have said, well, that's strange, that's a very localized story. Um, and now we know that basically every major city in the world has these issues of air pollution. And therefore, the, the, the story or the images about air pollution in Delhi are ringing a bell in Santiago, in Rio, in New York, Paris, wherever. Um, and so, you know, th th that is really driving, from our point of view, I engagement. It really comes from that globalization of the story, and, and, and images really, really carry that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Phil. I just wanted to tell you that we will be continuing this topic also at the conference that we will be holding in Dublin. And today the News Exchange published the blog uh, from Alexandra and also about the report. And uh, so you have also information about this. But if we are ready now with the microphone, any questions from the audience? Uh, there is a person who raised her hand first in the first uh, front row, please. Hello, thank you. I'm uh, Carolina and I'm thinking about how uh, news have changed and how 10 years ago maybe we had a knowledge gap. Now everyone who is in power to do something about climate change, they know very well what they need to do. So I'm thinking instead of journalism for knowledge, it's about journalism for the knowledge 
versus action gap. So what are governments not doing? And only what yesterday the UN requested in the International Court of Justice to, um, to advise on uh, governments' uh, obligations. Uh, and this is historical. And so I'm thinking, any reflections on actually reporting on what is not being done as uh, holding the powerful to account um, now when we're, we're actually uh, facing crunch time? Oh, sure. Um, obviously, it is important to report on what's not being done. I think this is what news organizations are good at and what they are doing. I mean, Hans uh, also told you this, it's almost uh, impossible to, to achieve that that uh, 1.55 degree goal. Um, but we shouldn't just wait for, for governments. And the fact is that there are solutions being developed all over the world. Nanette Brown from the UN also said that practically every day. And actually businesses, uh, even small businesses, are very much ahead of what governments have been doing all over the world. So, so newsrooms shouldn't stop at just reporting what governments are not doing, but actually what other actors are actually doing which you know doesn't obviously journalists have to report about gaps about uh, wrongdoing about everything in that respect but maybe you would like to or Hans from your experience yeah I mean I think it touches a little bit on on the whole issue of you know greenwashing and, and holding holding people to account um, you know we're in a phase now where everybody's understood the importance of communicating on the subject um, and so be it companies, governments, officials, and so on, there's a real need um, in news organizations to have the bandwidth to take that step back and really break down what people are saying and to hold them to account. And that, and that is hard in a real-time news environment. We work in a real-time social media-driven news environment. You know, if somebody says something, bang, it's gone already, before we really bore down into what they're saying. And I think that's, that's the real challenge. Uh, in such a real-time environment, how do you how do you sort of fact check and and hold that to account before before it runs away with itself? Um, and I think that's certainly the challenge that we see is is, is in, in that environment. How can you step back and, and and you know fact check in real time what what what's going out? Because there, there is a real need to do that. And and I think on that, uh, having a dedicated climate change team in the newsroom really helps because. <clears throat> it's not every day that climate change is breaking news and you have to sort of work as, as the rest of the newsroom uh, does. You do get quite a bit of time to follow up on things, to, to investigate a bit further, to, to sort of um, uh, not let go of the story on, on the first day. And I think also it's an interesting point to, to your question that um, uh, I, I think we're only starting to scrape the surface of this because Yes, there's been progress towards Paris goals and so on. Everyone can show for a sort of reduction in climate change. But I think basically all countries have started with the cheapest and, and, and easiest ways to cut emissions. And as you go further along, I mean, the IPCC is really good here as well in providing lists of like, okay, this needs to be done. This is how much everything costs per per, per, per ton of CO2 saved sort of. and, and um, most, on the, most of the things left on that list are things that are expensive and that have consequences for other things of society. So there's going to be a lot of conflict, a lot of debates around these, you know, how, how do we get down to that goal when we run out of the cheap and easy options. Hmm. Thank you, Hans. Uh, we can take maybe two more questions quickly. So uh, I see the lady here on the right. I think she was second before. Hi, my name is Laura and I um, do um, manage a newsroom and for me the biggest uh, challenge is not really to find the right content but to create a sustainable business model around climate journalism. So um, can you give me some example of publishing houses, media companies that really manage to make climate journalism sustainable, like to create subscriptions, to drive engagement, to have a massive reach? Because, well, I can create the best content, but if I don't get any subscriptions on it, it's, well, it's just hard for me to continue doing that. Sure, I can, I can take that one. Um, as you heard, many have just started to really invest, uh, you know, brain power and, and resources in climate journalism. So we are, we are early, and, uh, but 
what I found really interesting was that uh, the CEO of The Guardian and probably most media uh, brands admit that The Guardian is doing really advanced uh, climate coverage. And Anna Bateson, their CEO, said, said uh, at a conference in Oxford this year, um, so many of our of, of our uh, readers say they they give us money or they, they they join our membership program because they want other people to read uh, climate journalism for free. So they actually they don't read it themselves. They want other people to be able to read it. And I've discussed this with with a team actually. I'm I'm coaching in a different program. I'm working in and I said, look, you know, uh, people seem to be. Uh, they seem to be very happy with climate journalism. They, it seems to be engaging to people. Maybe they are not yet paying for it, but maybe if you, if you give them the opportunity to, like, you know, donate for others to read it, uh, that could be a, a, a forward-looking way. I have no idea. You have to test it. I mean, everything, you, every business model you have to test, obviously. But I found this really, really puzzling, uh, hearing this from The Guardian, that people pay for others to read it, but, but not for, for themselves. I'm sorry, but I'm getting the signs that we really have to wrap up. But of course, this was only the beginning of the conversation. The conversation continues for the next few days. So uh, thank you. I want to thank you, my panelists, uh, Alexandra Borhart, and also the co-authors, uh, Catherine and Felix, Phil, Chetwind, and Hans Kosonheide. Thank you very much, and we wish you a lovely rest of the day. Thank you.